Hello everyone, welcome to Do at 11.59. I'm your host, Susie, and Huddles, our co-host, is right over there. Before I get started, I do want to say that all sources are in the descriptions, um, and if you're listening, then the sources will be in the YouTube descriptions. If you guys have anything to say, or if there's any information that I might have missed word or mistaken or anything that I might have missed, please feel free to let me know in the comment. I will be looking that way because that's where all my notes are taken um, just so that I can refer back to my notes in case I miss anything. I've been wanting to do this story for a very very long time now. I think I worked on this for like over a week because I just felt like I was never ready to do it and, the re and, I, and I was like I don't want to miss any information so I've just been like I've just been like slowing myself down and making myself slow down just in case I miss any information however I think it's about time I do the story and let you guys know about this story that absolutely amazed me and when I first heard about it I was like what the actual hell like I could never imagine doing this or anyone doing this, but she fucking did. In 2000, Inez went into a labor, but she could not traditionally deliver the baby. And so, after just 12 hours of just excruciating pain and going through labor, she couldn't contact anyone. And she decided that it was either the baby dies or she needs to do something about it. And time was running out. So, finally, she decided to take a knife and cut her stomach open and perform a C-section with a kitchen knife. By Prove me wrong, but literally moms are fucking superhuman. You cannot tell me that they don't have superpower. Because, like, literally they have incredible instincts and they do the most extraordinary things that you would never imagine. Um, I actually heard a story about this mom who lifted a fucking car because she realized that her baby was in danger. And so to save her baby, she lifted a car. And they'll do anything to keep the baby safe. And in some situations, they'll even sacrifice themselves. Um, and so that's exactly what Inez Ramirez Perez did. Uh, I, I think I just butchered that so much, but... Um, we're just gonna move on. So Inez is from Mexico. She lives specifically in the area Rio Talia. I might have just butchered that again. Just to give a little bit of context about her situation, Inez lives in a one bedroom cabin in a very small village up in the mountain um, of Mexico. And so her, where she's living is very secluded. And what makes it worse is that she, there's no electricity or running water or sanitation that could be put into that place because it's just so secluded and it's not experiencing the best economic status as we do here. And um, in March 5th, 2000, Inez was 40 years old and she had, I believe, eight kids at that time. And as I mentioned, she had been experiencing just 12 hours of excruciating, painful labor. But the issue was that she couldn't call anyone for help or she, could she go somewhere? Uh, because she just lived so far from everyone and way up in the mountain. And she, I don't believe, has... Um, and she doesn't have a very good method of transportation. And so you guys might be wondering, where's the fucking husband? So Inez's husband had assisted in the last six births. However, during this time when Inez was going through labor, he wasn't home. Um, some says that he was at a cantina, which is just like a tavern or a bar, and the bar didn't have a phone. And I forgot to mention this, but Inez did have a phone. However, because the bar didn't have a phone, she couldn't contact him. However, I also read other sources that states that he was actually out in another city selling beans and trying to make some money for the family. And um, he had taken two of his sons uh, with him to sell beans. And I much prefer this version where he's actually 
doing something protective. It just sounds much more realistic compared to him being in a bar, or I hope so. Um, another issue was that the nearest medical team was about 50 miles away. And let me remind you, Inez lives in a very mountainous terrain, and you cannot be expecting a mother who's going through labor to be walking all that miles. I mean, even I struggle just walking a mile with carrying a backpack that's like 5 to 10 pounds. And mind you, I walk, I'm very lucky to be able to walk in a paved, smooth road. So it was just, what I'm trying to say is that it was impossible for Inez to get help. Okay, some will say that labor is not that painful, and pain is a very subjective thing, and there's no real way to measure pain. Um, however, I do want to provide a rough explanation of what labor feels like, just to get a better sense of what Inez was going through. So majority will experience something called a Hicks contractions or a Braxton Hicks contractions. And during this symptoms, contractions are very irregular. Um, the abdominal may feel tight every once in a while and there's going to be more discomfort than pain. Um, but as you know, you progress, there's going to be backache, pressure in the abdomen and the pelvis. And there's also going to be symptoms such as menstrual cramping. Now, I am very lucky to not have experienced a significant menstrual cramping. So, to some of us who don't know what menstrual cramping feels like, pretty much there's aches in the belly. There's pressure in the belly as well. And there's pain in the hips, the lower back, and also in the thigh. And according to some of the threads that I've read, um, when it's time for a mom to give birth, the body will push the baby out when the time comes, whether the mom likes it or not. And it's like having to pee. If you're, if you need to pee, you're going to pee no matter what. And if a mom cannot push the baby anymore, C-section will be required. However, if the fetus is in the birth canal for too long, then the fetus risks the chance of being deprived of oxygen and this could have serious complications or failure. The issue with Inez was that she could not traditionally deliver the baby, aka push the baby out. And you know, she was feeling all the force and everything, but the baby was just not coming out. And I couldn't find a source on what would happen if a mom can't give birth. But I did saw comments that said that either the baby will die or both the mom and the baby can die. And that's fucking scary. Before this pregnancy, Inez had previously lost a baby. During this time, there was a midwife that was helping Inez out. And the midwife said to Inez that she needed a C-section. However, there was no practical way to get her to the hospital quickly enough because she lived up in the mountain with no transportation, just alone, remote. Because the fetus couldn't pass through the birth canal, even though she was experiencing uterine contraction, um, ultimately, Inez lost the baby. With this current labor that she's experiencing, she remembered her failed labor, and later in an interview, she said, I couldn't stand the pain anymore. And if my baby was going to die, then I decided I would have to die. And so Inez paced around the room and mustered up the courage. And she decided by midnight that she would chug alcohol, which she did. And that was an attempt to decrease the pain of what she was about to do next. Inez asked her five-year-old son, Benito, to grab her a knife. And so he did. He grabbed a kitchen knife with about a six-inch blade. Mind you, Inez had no medical experience, and she relied on experiences from butchering animals. So she took the knife, held the knife by the blade instead of the handle, I think because for more control, and applied pressure to her stomach. So Inez cut about 6.75 inch vertical, which was up and down, lines near the belly button while she was squatting. And usually when a surgeon is doing a c-section they would do a horizontal cut along the bikini line which is from left to right but remember Inez doesn't have any medical experience and so she did what she thought was best for the baby 
But the issue with this was that she had to go over the cuts multiple times. So an hour later, Inez pulled out a baby boy by his feet and she realized that he began breathing. And so she sighed with relief as she noticed that everything was going to be just fine and he was going to be just fine. Now at this time, there were blood seeping everywhere, all over the floor. Inez grabbed the scissor after realizing that the baby boy was fine and cut his umbilical cord. And later she wrapped the baby to keep him warm and also wrapped her abdomen um, in a sweater to prevent too much blood from spilling out. After she did that, she put logs in the fire so that she could keep her and the baby warm and she fell unconscious. Some source states that after she woke up, she told Benito to get help, but other sources say that she told Benito to get help before she fell unconscious. But either way, by 4 a.m., Benito had returned with a local health aide and his name was Leon Cruz. So Leon provides health care, but no prenatal care. However, after he did an examination on Inez, he realized that the abdominal organs were just protruding out and he did his best to place them back in place inside her body. Leon, who came with another local health, sewed up Inez's wound uh, with just ordinary needles and thread. And there's a high chance that they didn't have anesthesia for this. And so after Inez woke up, she named the baby boy Orlando and they were taken to the local clinic. So Inez and Orlando was placed in a mini passenger bus, which drove along unpaved road to Lorenzo. Tex Melucon. However, once they arrived there, they realized that the physician there was ill-prepared and so they had to do another trip in an ambulance this time to San Pedro Huizetepec. Again, I'm so sorry. Um, which was eight hours away. And so once she arrived in the hospital there, they patched her up and this was 16 hours after Orlando was born. So the obstetricians at the hospital were just amazed and in disbelief. So the doctors say that because of the vertical cuts that she had done to herself, this prevented her from damaging any internal organs and ultimately kept her alive. They also noticed that there was no internal bleeding and no sepsis. So sepsis is a severe situation where the body responds to an infection and it causes a widespread inflammation through the body. And so an inflammation, again, is just an um, immune system which releases chemical into the bloodstream. So what happens is that when an immune system releases chemical into the bloodstream, this causes inflammation. And so if there's a prolonged inflammation, it may damage vital organs. But thankfully, Inez had no sepsis, so there was no inflammations. And her uterus was the same as if it had undergo an ordinary delivery. However, before they released Inez, they wanted to make sure that she was safe and healthy and there was no other injuries. And so they decided to do a laparotomy. So to do the laparotomy, they had to cut Inez's sewed up stomach and analyze the organ um, for any injuries. And so that's exactly what they did. And so when they were in there, they repaired the right paramedian uterine incision. And so they did this by cutting open the uterine wall on the top right of the midline of the uterus. So you have the uterus and then the top right of it. And they also did a tubal ligation. So this is a procedure where it's also known as a tube tied. And so pretty much the fallopian tubes is either cut or blocked to prevent the eggs from reaching the fallopian tube for fertilization. I'm not sure if they asked Inez um, about this, if she wanted her tube tied, but the doctors realized that it was probably the best to do this and prevent complications in the future. They also did a bowel exploration just to look into possible injuries. Before they sewed Inez up, they decided to irrigate the abdominal wall, which means that they wanted to wash out the abdomen to remove any debris, blood, or contaminations in there. When they were exiting, they had to 
um, close the uterine and the abdominal walls in layer. As they were going out, they sutured any necessary layer, such as the uterine wall, um, the abdominal wall, muscle, skin, and all that. And they also added a penrose drain, which was placed on each flank, which is between the rib and the hip. And a Penrose drain is pretty much a silicone or a latex tube that drains any fluid that may accumulate during the surgical procedure. And she was given three antibiotics therapy. Thankfully, that was the end of that procedure. However, her recovery was taking longer than normal. Um, during the third day, they realized that she showed sign of a bowel blockage. When they were examining her, they realized that there was no bowel blockage. And in the last podcast, if you guys haven't listened, I went into the importance of a bowel movement and the signs. So by the third day, the abdominal was swollen and enlarged and the new surgeons were confused. They needed to know what was causing it. Was it gas? Was it fluid? Was it something else? And so they decided to test the swollen abdomen. Um, at first, they x-rayed her to study the abdominal organs and the structures, which consist of size, shape, positions, and other stuff that could impact the enlarged abdominal. And the x-ray showed that some of the intestines were enlarged, which means that it was either blocked or there's an inflammation or other reasons. Because the x-ray didn't show any concrete reason as to why the abdominal was enlarged, they decided to do a nasogastric tube procedure. And so this in this procedure, the tube is inserted through the nose and down the stomach. And so with this method, it removes any fluids or gas and ultimately decompress the gastrointestinal tract or the stomach. However, after that procedure, there was no change and they decided that the surgeon needs to step in place for this. Finally, after the seventh day, after the first procedure, they decided to put Inez under a exploratory laparotomy. In this procedure, they had to cut open the abdomen and look into the abdominal cavity and check for organs and the structures of the inside and they needed to do this to rule out any mechanical intestinal obstructions and once they were in there they realized that there was no physical blockage to the gi tract but they did saw an adhesions so adhesion is pretty much a band of scar tissues and so the adhesions cause descending colon which is the bottom or the end of the colon to be twisted and so when the surgeons were in there they decided to cut the adhesion and remove the twisted colon 10 days after the first operation Inez recovered well and was finally released with her baby boy Orlando and Orlando and her went on a 12 hour ride back home and there was an article that said that at one point she decided to get off the bus and just walked for one and a half hour along the rocky road with Orlando strapped behind her back. I'm sorry, but she is crazy, but crazy in like the most amazing, powerful way. Because how can she do that just after just days after her surgeries? I, it's fucking insane. As of right now, I saw that there's about five self perform c-section that was successful and Inez is one of them and I think overall this story really highlights the importance of a safe and accessible birthing locations and just options for moms and I feel like moms shouldn't have to be forced to make choices to take extreme measures just so that they could protect themselves or the baby and I feel like there's so much room for the healthcare systems to improve but just reading this case made me realize how strong mothers are but anyways I'm so glad to be able to tell you guys about Inez and her story and if there's anything else you guys want me to cover just let me know and hopefully I'll see you guys in the next episode bye